Thanksgiving. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. My name is Lance French. I'm the Business Development Manager for w and Environmental, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar on Environmental Program Management. Our expert for today is w and President, Nick Andriani. Welcome, Mr. President. <laughs> thanks, Lance. It's Nick. I thought we talked about this. Okay, President Nick. I got it. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, before we get started, I want to go over a few housekeeping items. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please send them through the chat tab on your GoToWebinar window. If we don't get your question, I will make sure Nick sees it and we will get an answer to you as soon as possible. We are recording this webinar and it will be available to rewatch on our website soon along with the slides and I will send you an email with the link when they're made available. So I'm hoping um, by one o'clock, but I can't promise that. So sounds good. Okay, Nick, let's get started. Environmental program management. Well, let's first of all, let's introduce our listeners to you. So yeah, you no, definitely. Today we're going to talk about environmental program management, but uh, I've been with w &M for uh, gosh, this is my 18th year, uh, seen a lot of changes here at w &M. Uh Started my, my career really in the remediation side of the business, but for the last, gosh, about eight years, really been focused on uh, environmental compliance uh, and building out systems uh, for corporate level and facility, facility level across the board. Um, in some cases, working with legal partners, uh, in all cases, working directly with industry and in, in trying to establish a, a program to not only get into compliance, but then what can we do to stay in compliance? And um, along with 80% of our company, you went to Texas A&M? Texas A&M. Okay. Yes, I know. It's, and, and are you, what did you graduate with in? Well, I mean, me, well mechanical engineering. I'm, I'm a professional Aggie, before, yeah. uh, besides all the Aggie. Before your folklore. professional Aggie, yeah. But uh, yeah, professional engineer now, mechanical engineering uh, by education. And I got my PE in environmental uh, engineering. So that includes public water systems, wastewater systems, uh, RECRA, waste issues, and a lot of the things we're, we'll be talking about today. Uh, we work with a number of different industries and, and have implemented these management systems uh, and environmental programs across a number of them. Just, just a quick run through. Uh, manufacturers, a fair amount of work in the food and beverage industry, uh, midstream oil and gas, uh, mining, in aggregates, concrete and aggregates, uh, electric utilities, uh, waste disposal and recycling facilities, chemical plants, refineries, even jewelers and eyewear manufacturers. So we've seen uh, a fair a fair amount of variety, but the basics uh, are still the same. Well, um, so basically, if if whoever is listening out there. I mean, this is. I mean, this is definitely going to be relevant to them. Yeah. Because, I mean, okay. it, it hopefully, is what we're what we're going to talk about today is not the nuts and bolts of of how do I do a waste audit and and how do I calculate my air emissions, but uh, taking a step back and saying what are the components of a successful environmental program, and what kind of things can we put in place and be aware of uh, to have a successful program to ensure long term compliance. Okay. Awesome. Well, let's get. Started so. Yeah, so the question and in, in, in what we put up on the website and the blog a couple weeks back was, and we hear this all the time from from leaders and from um, senior executives in organization where, where they ask the simple question, are we in compliance? And, and of course, the environmental professionals out there and, and those who are, are faced with this every day know that's not such a simple question. It's a snapshot in time most often. And really, it's one of those things on, well, from what I know, we're in compliance. Or maybe today. Or maybe today, or definitely we were yesterday. yesterday. Yeah, yesterday yeah. we were definitely in compliance. But one of the things we, we look at is how can we structure it? How can we involve others? And what kind of things can we do so that you can answer this question? You can pass this information up. Uh, oftentimes we see shareholders uh, having a great interest in this. Uh, consumers and customers. A lot of times a market sector might dictate certain requirements or expectations of a company. And so, you know, it's taking uh, a look at what type of program a company needs or a facility needs is a big question here. You know, everybody doesn't need an ISO 14001 certified environmental management system program. We do those. Mm -hmm. They have their spot, certainly. But most often we're creating a framework that's not uh, not a certified environmental management system 
that meets the needs of the client, meets the needs of the company based on their, their risk tolerance, based on their expectations of their, their key management and their shareholders, and just trying to find the right fit. So it's not a one size fits all. And I'm sure that if there are share, shareholders out there, they're probably not environmental experts anyway. So they're basically relying on their environmental manager. And so. It, exactly. So it's looking to the environmental manager, and the environmental team and saying, uh, you know, we're trusting you to keep us out, right. out of, out of, um, you know, hot water mm -hmm. and to keep us. Uh, and it's constantly clients. moving. It's constantly rules are changing. Regulations are changing all the time. So. Oh yeah, they are. And, and knowing, knowing where you fit in the realm of regulations and, and why you're doing certain things, you know, we also go to sites where they're doing things they don't, they don't really need to be, mm. you know, certainly it's, it's, it's not a bad thing to, to over comply. But if you're really being challenged and looking at um, everyone's tight on resources and, and money. And so, you know, looking at why are we doing things? Are we spending our time and effort and our resources in the right place? Okay, cool. So we're going to launch a poll question here really quick. And it's going to be, you can see it on your, on your screen there. So what is the greatest challenge in maintaining environmental compliance at your company or facility? And me. And so it's, I've launched that right now. Yeah. So, so. we, we came up with these, um, training and awareness is on here. Uh, option B is culture and management support. C is not understanding the rules or regulations and then D communication, uh, put these together. And based on what we see as we're out talking to, to folks and, and those that run their environmental programs, you know, these are oftentimes, uh, issues that, that are uh, roadblocks or or impede the progress on on the success of the program. And I found out yesterday there is no one right answer. Yeah, there's so, no, yeah, there's certainly not a, a right answer. Yeah. Okay. Just and 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 honestly, this might be flavor of the week. It used to be training, but now it's more about communication. Okay, this this is interesting. I'm going to share this. Um, and Nick, I don't think you can see it, but um. So our results were 31% training and awareness, 31% culture management, culture and management support, 31% on not understanding rules and regulations, and then 8% communication. So okay. I thought that was pretty cool. Okay, so we got some great communicators out there. Of course, engineers and scientists always good communicators. Really? <laughs> okay. That's but awesome. yeah, so uh, really interesting. Split uh, third, third, third for for. Training, awareness, culture, and um, rules and regulations. Okay. So does that surprise you or is that generally? No. I mean, we see uh, we see these all the time. And, and honestly, uh, if people could have chosen more than one option, my guess is they probably would all have. All the above. If all, I put all the above all the there, above, it probably would have been. Yeah, that makes it not, yeah. not as exciting of a poll question, right? But we put together these, these seven keys to success. Uh, and again, we're not going to talk today about the technical – um, process or details of of actually achieving compliance, but what are some strategies you can implement uh, as you as you look to involve others and build a team for a successful okay. program? So seven keys to success. Did you actually steal that from Stephen Covey, or is that just yeah? I, did, I was hoping you wouldn't thing. notice, but <laughs> but the seven is a good number, right? Seven it's an keys odd number. to highly successful environmental compliance. And so communication and and I'm not going to say these are in any particular order, but is what we have found is uh, there's an, a variety of communication issues and tools that can really affect uh, how others are involved, the awareness of others in the program. And uh, what we'll talk about here in a little bit is, you know, what do you do when you have an issue or a spill or an upset event? And is that uh, communicated properly? Uh, the team, uh, certainly I know uh, lots of times the environmental manager uh, or director of environmental, whatever your specific role uh, might be, you can feel like you're shouldering the whole burden, uh, but really these programs work best when, when there is synergy, when others are involved and there's a team approach to it. Regulatory applicability, uh, this is the nuts and bolts, right? Or do we know the regulations that apply to us? And are we, are we gearing our everyday approach to that? Are we doing what we need to do? Are we not doing things we don't need to do, especially when, when resources are tight? Uh, best practices. 
So looking here uh, within your organization, uh, you might have different facilities, you might have, have different uh, leaders throughout the, the company that have come up with some really good solutions and best practices in their roles, sharing those best practices, and then, and then really having some opinions on, well, this is how we handle this specific waste. Or to achieve our storm, stormwater compliance across facilities, we've, we've found it best to do this and implement these programs. So sharing those best practices can be, it sounds very basic, but a, but a real, real uh, success story. Uh, training, you know, this is certainly on a need to know basis and an awareness level. Everybody doesn't need to be the environmental expert, but being able to train and, and make aware uh, the entire team on what the goals are, why we're doing this, and certainly the risk uh, that's out there if you don't stay in compliance, but training others is a big one. And then these last two are, uh, we don't see used as often across the board, but we try to implement them the best we can. So tracking goals and key metrics, this would be, and we're gonna talk about this more, but establishing goals for maybe minimization or cost goals or incident numbers, uh, and then metrics. What, what can we report up to management to show that, you know, what does the environmental guy do? <laughs> And, so, yeah. and then one more here, uh, the dashboard and tools. And we've, the, the dashboard is a great tool to, to track progress, to track areas of concern and then show others. And, and really stepping back and saying, what kind of cool tools make sense for my business and, and our facility? Maybe there's some checklists that, that are routinely done and, and we could digitize those. We've got a, a good software platform that digitizes these things in, in a matter of, of no time. Uh, but are there some technology tools or spreadsheets that uh, that you can use to to really simplify things and, and and make everybody's job easier? So when you're out in the field and you go to some of these facilities or or, or companies, are, are there any any of these seven that are um, more frequent? Like you know what I go to any facility, they're always going to have a their tracking goals is going to be an issue, or you know. The communication is lax or is there anything or is it just kind of like it depends on where day and depends you, on where you go. You know, it's funny that communication only got 8% on the survey, but the communication and the training is what we found most often is is the real crux of it. The environmental manager knows uh, certain key managers and leaders across the organization might know. Um, but with things like waste and wastewater and, and really controlling what goes down the drain or how we handle certain wastes that are generated, that's communication, that's training, and that's making people aware uh, across the organization of what needs to what needs to happen. All right, well, let's just jump into team and communication. Yeah, certainly we're going to dive into these. Uh, what we found the best is you know involve stakeholders. This could look different for uh, for each of you out there or 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 if there's an attorney out there for of course, we know organizations are definitely different. but the management team to an extent, uh, dictating the culture, uh, dictating the risk tolerance and the expectations of the program. Uh, you know, every program is not, doesn't necessarily set out with the same goals. It certainly want to stay in compliance, avoid fines and penalties and, and bad press. But, but an, an environmental program at one company might be really looking to be a world-class leader, best in class, and, and do everything the right way with strong sustainability. And, and others are, are most often looking to just protect themselves and and really implement some cheap insurance and so that there's not um, not egg on on their face. But to do that, you got to involve operations. You got to involve the management team. And in the operations, um, what we see often is there can be tension between the environmental team and operations. And it's because I think there's a perception that the environmental needs to be a burden, and or maybe they weren't brought into the fold soon enough. And so, yes, uh, you know, using uh, segregating waste and, and uh, managing, you know, fence line air emissions, that, that could be a burden on, on operations. I However, to, I just want to do a side note. We did launch the seven, um, Oh, the seven, the uh, seven rules. Mm -hmm. What are they called? Keys. The, the seven keys. The sorry. Seven keys. The to seven success. keys to success. So, uh Sorry to. No, that's good. And, that I, we, and a, I did 
just so our listeners know, we, we combined six and seven as one because uh, go to webinar only lets me do five answers. So, Te- technology sorry. Sorry. considerations. Sorry about it. So yeah, so operations. No. Yeah, so operations, involving operations, uh, because the reality is they are affected. They do have to deal with it. But the um, so involving them early and often uh, into the process is is hugely helpful and getting their feedback so that we can tweak and refine and and there might be unintended consequences at times and so being open to the fact that uh, you know that sounded like a great idea but it's really uh, a challenge to struggle with uh, for the operations team can can be challenging uh, is is there lawyers or general counsel or there others uh, that need to be involved that'll be different for each one of you out there but. Uh, but something to, to work through and saying, who is there someone from corporate, corporate environmental manager uh, that needs to be involved and, and can provide some guidance there? You have results? Yeah. Actually, for, for a minute there, it was kind of cool. Um, every one of them was 17%. I was like, oh, please stay that way. But it did. <laughs> it changed a little bit. So yeah, let me close it really quick. So, yeah, let me share the results here. So we have uh, – they were really, really close. Uh, 20% say communication. Uh, 13% uh, the team, 13% uh, understanding regulatory applicability, uh, 20% said training, and then, which I don't think surprised me, uh, 33% track goals, key metrics, dashboards, and sorry, my phone's going off. Um, so so does any, any of that surprise you? So it's kind of all over the board. It's, it, it is, and, it, and it's a, just a testament to that there's a, a number of puzzle pieces to put together to, to really have a successful program in place. The communication on here, communicating processes, right? We're looking at different forms of communication that we've seen in, in areas that we dig into and work on. Once a process is established within an organization or there's a, a best-in-class process that a certain facility is done, how do you communicate that? Do you make a cheat sheet? Do you bring your key people together and, and train them on this process so that we're doing it consistently? And what we've seen, especially from TCQ, EPA, and, and local inspections is consistency is a huge deal. If you're doing things consistent and an inspector can see that there's some level of thought put into a process, and when they say, well, why do you do it this way? And if, if you can have an answer for that, and show consistency, that really goes a long way. Uh, you know, what an inspector's trying to do is they come on a facility for a matter of two or four hours or, or maybe on a big one a day. Uh, they, they can't digest everything, but they're trying to ascertain the, the, the awareness of regulations and, and understand, you know, how this organization is, is approaching. Is there at least clients. a good effort? Exactly. You know. I mean, that's not going to get you out always, but it sure does go a long way to show you're a good actor. You're trying to do the right things and you have processes there. Very cool. Escalating observations and issues. This is something that a lot of folks don't think about in terms of communication, but if we have a spill, how do we handle it? Who needs to be involved early on? Who who needs to be in that communication chain so that we can not only address the issue immediately, but there might be a notification requirement. Is there someone on that communication chain that that's asking, oh, what's the reportable quantity? And And so oftentimes it's not, and not until there is an issue where they, or a facility might might develop that list, or it might just be issues and observations that there's not a, a catastrophic spill or not a immediately um, dangerous to to life or health situation, but just an observation. Hey, we keep seeing the same thing. Mm-hmm. Our wastewater plants continuously upset with this because something's going down the drain. How can we circle that back, communicate it to others, so that we can get that corrective action? So should you know, listening, be a part of, I mean, my wife always says listening is an important part of communication. It is. So, she, she tells you so, that. Huh? Yeah, so, I've heard uh, it once Multiple times. Yeah, multiple times. Um, but so is there, is there a program that you have in that where, you know, the, you know, the employees or the, you know, the people of the facility have, are empowered to, to bring up a problem is that part of communication too or it it is and it's this walking around management the the environmental manager can't do everything they don't they certainly can't see everything and they rely on others you know you can only train people it's much like safety a safety culture Mm -hmm. you can train them but you can't be there and make every decision for for everyone on the team and so yeah empowering the team 
making sure everyone knows who's accountable for the environmental program, but also they have a responsibility in it. Uh, you know, all the way from the, you know, the, the workers on a manufacturing floor or, or to the, if you're midstream oil and gas to uh, every, all the pipeliners out in the field, uh, you know, how their roles, what the decisions they make, uh, they're responsible for those and how that feeds into the, the overall program. So, yeah, and you had mentioned it that, you know, most of the time the people that are in charge of all this is the EHS managers. Well, environmental, it's environmental health and safety. So that's that's a big job. It, it is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. At yeah. different facilities, they, they lump them together differently. But oftentimes we see it's EHS all three manager, at once, yeah. the EHS manager. And um, the regulations there, um, I'm going to move on to the next one, which is regulatory applicability. And, and, and this is, this is hard to be, um, you know, the all knowing expert of all regulations. And as you mentioned earlier, regulations change and, um, thresholds change and due dates change and implementation dates change. And so, uh, what we usually recommend is a regulatory applicability screen as a good starting point. We call them RASs, by the way. We do. I'm going to say RAS because I have a really problem with applicability screen. That was good. I, I that have, was good. I no, I practiced last night. Mm -hmm. So just so everybody knows, when I say RAS, I mean regulatory applicability screen. That's twice. Maybe I'll go. No, I just stick with RAS. So, okay. You're good. You've, you've used all your voice. <laughs> the, uh, but yeah, the RAS is a, um, is a great tool. And is what we do there is we go into a facility and, and we're making recommendations and observations based on your operations and the rules that apply. And, and so, you, yes, there's a research component to that. We, we do a fair amount of data gathering, uh, your waste generator status, your air permitting status. But we'll look at, at various emission points, various sources across your facility. And um, it's just a really nice checks and balances to say, you know, were you aware of this or are you, are you aware that you're really approaching this threshold? And that might really change your permitting strategy. Uh, so RAS is a great, great starting point. Do that internally or get the help of others. Uh, it, it helps show uh, accountability to the rules and regulations. We all know that when an inspector comes on site, they're rarely looking at just stormwater or just looking for your TRI data or something. They're, they're, they're going to look at the holistic approach and want to check check everything. And when, a, when an inspector comes on your site, it's not necessarily a screen. It's probably... Well, in that case, it's going to be an audit and there's going to be consequences to it. So if right. you do this process internally first, that's very helpful. And probably better, it's probably good to have an outside, some outside eyes to see some of these issues because, you know, I can walk by, you know, issues at, at my house all the time and it didn't really, doesn't really bother me. But, you know... No, you're you're exactly right. You you get um, you know not lazy intentionally, but but when you see something constantly, it's yeah. good to have a new set of eyes. We've seen this. Obviously, we do these as consultants uh, a lot, um, but we've seen uh, folks come from different parts of a company. You know, bring someone in from a different region, new set of eyes. Oh well, mm -hmm. we handle this this way over here. Have you considered doing that? And so that can be be hugely helpful. Um, the maintaining compliance portion here is. The real risk of an environmental program is you're in compliance immediately once it's, once it's established or you do an audit, some sort of audit might be triggered for a reason and then you make corrective actions and you spend a bunch of money and you're in compliance, um, you know, there at the completion of the audit. But what happens 18 months down the road? What happens 24 months down the road? And what kind of process or system do you have in place to ensure long-term compliance? What, what we see a lot of from, from management support is uh, just the, the, the opinion that this is going to cost a lot of money and is it really going to gain me anything in the long term? I'm just going to put out a lot of small fires and then am I going to have the same issues you know, one or two years down the road? But if you can develop a, a program or, or consider these, these components and building it for the long term, it you know, be much easier on everybody. Knowing the limitations, this is a this is a really big one that's that's helpful, especially for growing facilities and growing growing industry. Uh, there's especially in air permitting. There's different thresholds. There's different permit levels, and and you might be in your current size might be just fine running on permit by rule, but once you get to a certain point, once you once your emission sources grow, 
uh, you know, you might need to, to switch permitting strategies for air. And knowing when that's going to take place is hugely helpful for the engineering group, for the leadership that's driving growth, so that you can hit that early on. Because we all know an air permit doesn't get turned around in 30 days. It takes a long time. Yeah, and I remember when we did our air permit webinar a couple months back, um, you just brought up air. I was, like, I was always surprised on everything needs an air permit. Yeah, every, everything does. Everything needs an air permit, and if you change anything, it needs a different permit. Well, and Almost. this is this it's, is what you and I were talking about earlier on the change management is oftentimes people in the facility don't realize that if you change that engine or if you change that generator or if you add, um, you know, an exhaust point in the roof, that, that that is important to the environmental manager, you know. And so having a good change management process internally, uh, you need to add a new boiler because we're, you know, we're running out of capacity. Well, th does that need to be addressed? And, and so having a good change management process internally uh, can really help and, and win you friends on the inside because hopefully you're not making other people's jobs harder uh, just simply because they didn't know you needed to know or, or now, they, now they have to delay or, or fast track some solution that, that, of course, just disrupts everything. So regulatory applicability is the big one. It's also the obvious one. You know, we spend most of our time talking about the nuts and bolts on on how to achieve compliance or how to write a permit, but but having those conversations with with key folks can be critical. You know, yeah, I've, I've met some EHS managers um, at different trade shows and stuff, and a lot of times they're they've said getting management on board to do some of this stuff. So I would imagine what the management sees is they see a like somebody on listen, hey, you know what, I think this is a great idea. We need to do a, a RAS going, you know, just have one. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's what, four, five hours. It, well, I guess it would depend on. How yeah. We're on site for, you know, typically a half a day for larger facilities more. We, we, we request some, some files and, and, and copies of permits yeah. at a time and we review those, but yeah, it's, it's so, a check. So balances. somebody's out there thinking, well, yeah, why wouldn't we just to have, mm -hmm. you know, just to have somebody have our back and, but sometimes the managers would see, Co the cost, you know, right. Uh, yeah, okay. I mean, so is there any, has there been a time where you've actually gone and done one of these things and, and actually have uh, found things that they're maybe need to change and actually have saved them oh, money? Yeah, yeah. No, great question. We've, uh, we've saved literally millions of dollars at certain facilities and usually that's around waste, right? Mm -hmm. Not understanding waste classifications, not understanding, um, that when you when you mix certain certain wastes that, that now you have uh, you know say a, a thousand pounds of hazardous waste when you really only had ten mm -hmm. and so waste segregation uh, waste management is and, and waste minimization are really the big ones there to where we can typically come in and and, and really make a difference on the bottom line uh, how they handle universal waste things like that uh, but it is you're right it is often, I mean, we're, we're not making money for these facilities, mm -hmm. right? We're, we're not the operations team that's, that's building the widgets mm -hmm. and, and increasing production. Environmental is, in, is a cost, is a cost center. Uh, however, when done right, uh, it could be definitely a cost benefit and it can really help streamline, you know, a facility. But, but it takes some effort to get it to where it's like that. Do we have any examples or without going into, you know, exactly who or what, but, or, uh, on those? Yeah, I mean, like, or did... Uh, yeah, I mean, it really comes down to, you know, in certain cases, um, water use and water minimization. Mm -hmm. You know, we've we've gone into sites where we put water meters on and, and start really looking at consumption and saying, did you realize that a third of your consumption is over here, you know, watering that field? And that field's not making you any money, right? You're, you make your money inside the factory where you're, where you're generating your, your product. And but you're spending a lot of money on that. And that's or, a, and that was a real life case. Real life right case. There. Or do you need to? Um, you maybe you don't need to expand your public water system any longer. Mm -hmm. If instead we implement some conservation and water reuse techniques. Okay. And so we can we can minimize capex costs. We can we can minimize um, you know time to permit and 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 reduce those timelines so that the facility can grow quicker and stay in compliance. 
And so we're not just looking at constantly writing new plans, writing new permits, or, or building new systems, mm -hmm. but how can we stretch a couple more years out of this wastewater system? How and, can we stretch more? more and you said you system? don't know what you don't know, and this is a great way to get in the know. It, I mean, it really. Is, it is. Using a, you know, a set of fresh eyes and 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 almost just a, um, you know, a fail check and say, yep, we got it. I'm glad we got it. Or there might be an upcoming regulation next year that you want advance notice on and so that you yeah. can inform others. A Nobody little, likes yeah, surprises. A little peace of mind in this crazy world yep. that we Yeah, good point. Absolutely. Okay, so let's go to best practices and training. Okay, yep. So for best practices and training, uh, we spend a lot of our time training. We spend a lot of our time helping people identify best practices and then implementing them. And so standard operating procedures, yeah, across industries are, are usually fairly common, but within facilities and how and roles and responsibilities within an organization, that's where we really want to spend some time on, on how do we achieve compliance? What are our standard operating procedures? Who's involved with that? Who, Lance, if, if you and I are on the team to, on this SOP, what parts do you do and what parts do I do so that we all know that that's not falling through the cracks? Okay. Um, being consistent, right? If we're, if we have a, um, uh, we're a large quantity generator and we need to do certain inspections on a, on a routine basis. Are we doing those inspections consistently? Are we, uh, are we tracking and documenting those inspections? And so we're looking for consistency here. Of course, if you can be consistent, you can then tell the regulator or the auditor, uh, when that's, when that's time. And if that does come up training, making sure other people are aware of, of, of these things that we were just talking about. Regulatory limitations, um, permit thresholds, and and when something might change. You know, we're we're a small quantity generator now, and and then and then at what point do we become a, a large quantity generator? Many of our clients have grown over time. That's the goal of of business, right? Mm -hmm. To be to be growing. And honestly, it's just to that in that point when someone when a company has grown that they finally have the resources and the the awareness of a, of a good strong environmental program. And so if a business was started in a garage, it's not, may not be that big of a deal if they mishandle some waste or if they're over classifying and disposing of something as hazardous if they don't need to be. But as they grow and scale, that becomes, you know, a huge opportunity to not only save money, um, but to, to get some, some good processes in place there. Uh, making sure the right people understand the goals. Uh, it's one thing for the environmental manager to know, but if the, if the person on the floor or in the field doesn't know what to do with a waste stream or, or how to fill out a manifest properly, um, that could be a real issue. If you don't understand, um, uh, you know, what, what's in the air permit in terms of maintenance requirements, if the maintenance team isn't part of that, or at least the maintenance manager, uh, you know, you can really back yourself into a hole there. And so awareness and training across programs. Uh, this is, like I was saying earlier, you're not making everyone environmental manager for sure, but if you have an all hands meeting or, 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 or some sort of opportunity to, to talk to people, even a couple monthly or even a couple times a year, uh, and, and make sure environmental is on their mind and, and they know the things that, that they can affect personally, that's hugely helpful. And then of course, issue and issue reporting. We talked about this in communication, but what is our best practice? Do we train on it? You know, in the oil and gas world, you have we have tabletop drills to where we we mimic these these pipeline releases, and everybody's involved in your staging this event because there is strong coordination, or 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 mm. hopefully strong coordination in place. And so, how do we how do we train and, and document our best practices on how we respond to issues? Well, uh, one of our listeners. Uh said that the environmental guy keeps the plant manager out of jail. <laughs> you know, that is, uh, that is very true. Thanks, the, thanks Tom for that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the good environmental guys do for sure. Yeah. And, and we've heard that more than once where we go in, maybe there's an issue that's been identified or the, in the state or EPA comes out and, um, and you got that plant manager, that GM in the meeting and they just look at the table and say, Hey, y'all, y'all can have whatever resources you need, but just keep me out of trouble. Yeah. Yep. Keep me out yep. of jail. So Tom's right there. You for know, sure. yeah, I would say it, it would be worth it to have a Raz if it would keep me out of prison. Yep. That would be, that would be good. So, 
Well, and, and on that point, tracking goals and metrics, you know, these don't have to be, you know, facility changing or, or earth shattering goals. Uh, but what are you tracking and what goals do you have and, and sharing them with the team so there can be um, some awareness around this? The, what we've seen that works the best is if, if when the environmental manager isn't just working by himself. So not trying to change the world and reinvent the culture. But just having enough influence to where there is a bit of a culture and awareness around environmental, around safety for sure. You know, we had a great webinar last month on safety culture and, uh, and really talking about some of those things. But, you know, we see different environmental metrics um, or different metrics in general and key performance indicators, KPIs developed. I just wanted to cover a few that we've seen in the sustainability or environmental and safety worlds. Uh, sustainability might be something like water conservation, you know, minimizing water use. You might be, uh, you know, in Texas, especially if, if you're in the northern part or the panhandle, you know, you know the, the Ogallala Aquifer is not, not rising, it's, it's dropping. And, and so, you know, these groundwater districts are having increasing uh, requirements on facilities. And so is there maybe a water conservation metric that can be put in place or our long range goal? As we trade out, swap out equipment, maybe we introduce some some recycling and reuse options there. Um, minimizing energy use, you, you know, is is there, uh, especially with with even basics like lighting and fluorescent bulbs, that affects universal waste. It affects energy consumption, and so the environmental team doesn't always have to be this um, this cost center. But, but oftentimes you can create your own budget by, by making some, some good beneficial changes across the organization. Uh, another sustainability goal we've implemented at certain times when necessary is natural resources driven, right? Are we, are we protecting or restoring or, or are we ensuring protection of, of some stream or, or nearby resource? Or are we actually going to restore you know, some natural resources as part of our long-term plan? Uh, that can go a long way, uh, not only for corporate culture, but for good success stories and things like that. On the environmental side, uh, you know, in terms of potential metrics or, or KPIs to follow, you know, source reduction, um, air emissions, and, and really monitoring air quality, of course you need to do that for your permit, uh, but really making a, a tangible KPI around that. Uh, waste minimization and segregation, uh, looking, really looking at, at the waste we're generating and we're, that we're minimizing those waste streams uh, and, and, and minimizing our amount of hazardous waste that we generate. Or recycling options. You know, so much of, of what, we've, what we, quote unquote, have done for years is, oh, got to haul that off the landfill or, or, or need to haul that off to the disposal facility. Uh, but so much can be recycled and reused now that there's really some nice opportunity for that. Oftentimes it saves money. Not always, but it's mm -hmm. nevertheless, it's a really good message as well. Well, yeah, I can imagine that, you know, and you, you said it, um, hazardous waste, you know, I know that a lot of facilities out there have different, th you know, different things to go to different places, right? Like hazardous, tr trash, recycle, whatever. Well, if training is not up to speed, communication is not up to speed, I guarantee you I know what the what the, everybody's going to do when in doubt. What's convenient for me? Let's just, I'd rather right. put it in one. Uh, it's all hazardous because it's, you know. Or they might even not know. You know, they, the, the person uh, in the field or, or on the, the manufacturing floor might not even realize that there's a difference or understand that, that there's uh, a regulatory, you know, component to how much hazardous waste the, a site generates mm -hmm. or certainly a cost component to that. But oftentimes without instruction, yeah, I mean, do whatever's would, easiest for them. And you would think, and I think that it's changed because I, 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 <laughs> I attend the record classes. A lot of it goes over my head, but I did know I was amazed at sometimes the littlest things like the wipes. Yes, the, you know yep. where I think that might have changed, but recently, but the wipes. That's right. there's a there's a wipe rule that most yeah. states have adopted. But there, yeah, what do we do with oily rags, and 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 what's the the best process for that, and and making it easy enough um, to have your employees be successful in that and in, in being able to, to, to do what's needed. Um, universal waste mentioned that earlier. There's a lot of things you can do around light bulbs and purchasing and, 
and um, and longevity there. And then uh, another one that we've seen, especially in facilities that use metals, and is is reclamation of material and involving the manufacturer and having some life cycle contract with them, and working with the manufacturer to say, hey, can we reclaim the waste and the excess and sh- and send that back to you? And can we even get a credit? But even if you don't get a credit, you're minimizing what you're paying for out the back door and you're, and you're not paying to dispose of that stuff. Gotcha. All right. So we're going to go to the, uh, our next slide, which is uh, dashboards and tools. But before we do, I'm going to uh, just launch our last poll of the day. And it's basically um, how many of our listeners out there are actually using a dashboard or what or, or tool, I guess you could say. So, um, cause I think, I, I think it's going to be, um, I think we're going to see a lot of no's because that was when, on the first poll question, that was one of the things that they wanted to work on. Yeah. So, but yeah, no, you're, you're right. And, and a dashboard, we're going to show an example here that that I've, uh, redacted information on. It was a, a real live dashboard we used, uh, for years with a client. Um, uh, but, but the dashboard is a great visual indicator of what's going on. I mean, We've all we've all seen or or use like you know budgeting software at home that puts it in this nice pie chart for us so we can see what's going on and let's be honest we're just visual people and it's sometimes it's a lot easier to see uh, maybe something broken down by color category red yellow green or something like that to just give a snapshot in time and say yeah I, I can by looking at that I can see and get the warm fuzzies and and know that we're well, thirty-three no percent said yes, they do, which is good. Yep. Um, and then fifty-eight percent said no. Eight um, percent say they put their cell phone on it when they drive. So there you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, dashboard. So, what's a so dashboard? So the dashboard. I mean, here's one, and I, I instead of just creating one from scratch, I took a real life example, and you can see here that we've broken things up in terms of, uh, in this case environmental and um, safety programs. And then in this particular client, they had six facilities doing roughly the same thing. And then they had a warehouse. And, and so, you know, across each one of those facilities, what's the status of our air permitting? Well, in most cases, the air permitting had been, been recently audited in October, November. In some cases for the facilities, the the air was scheduled to be audited in January, February or June or, or September of, 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 in this case, 2015. Uh, but of course, each facility is at a different stage and probably has a, a slightly different timeline. And as the environmental manager, you want to do that. You want to, you, you want to spread out those, those assessments so that if you do find anything, you have time to address it. And now you haven't created six air permitting jobs. Or, or or made it nearly impossible to and, to comply. And not to mention, I, I mean, I don't know uh, the company that this is, but maybe one or even multiple of these facilities could be out of state, and that could have different oh, laws oh, altogether. Very true. We we rarely see you know all facilities in the same state right. or EPA region. So and so state by state requirements. That would be come, a good idea to say, hey, play. Louisiana has this mm-hmm. due when none of our other ones have you know have that regulation or so. uh, yeah and we all know louisiana is not different at all so i don't know why they would they would be that they're way. weird but, I'm just teasing. No, but they but they do state by state requirements are, are out there and so in this case we've split up the dashboard not only by facility and warehouse and you can see there for the warehouse you know for air none required you know they don't they don't have uh, or they or they may just have a, a couple pbrs that that make sense for for that facility but but to the extent of the other sites uh, which are operating facilities, there, there's really no air permitting requirements there. But we've also added on here wastewater and stormwater and waste management, uh, regulatory reporting, which would be the, the, the TRI, the tier twos, the annual waste summaries that are required throughout the year. And then an auditing. In this case, we had a, we had a rolling audit, internal audit schedule. And so we're capturing all of that here. Yeah, you, know, you can see real easily that facility number three, needs to spend a little time and effort on wastewater. And if I'm reporting this up to my manager or my general counsel, or if we're preparing for a merger, you know, we're going to want to make that red box go away. And, and so we do that by putting little notes. What do we need to do in this case, install a wastewater treatment system or a capture tank. And we feel like that's going to address the issue. 
Yeah, that's awesome because, um, you know, that's exactly where my eye went. My eye went direct. If I was, you know, um, let's say a shareholder and I was looking at this and boop, red, yeah, right. red, I'm, I looked at that. One of these thing. things doesn't look like the other. I yep. looked at that very first. And then I w- questioned if this actually came from the CIA because we redacted the whole thing. But we, yeah, we, there's a fair amount of redaction on here because you know we took I'm the kidding. client names off and all that. But the, and you can see some of the yellows need to evaluate the discharge. You know, maybe, maybe not. Things have changed. We've grown. We've recently doubled the size of our warehouse. You know, does that matter? Um, is our septic system still the right size? You know, we can cover lots of things in here from, Relatively minor to certainly, you know, fairly significant, depending on on your client. So when you help set up, I mean, so let's say you help set up this dashboard for a company, right? That's what. Oh yeah. That's what would you? So because I I would imagine that I look at this, that can be overwhelming. Looking at that at a glance. Well, in in there, and what needs to be on there, right? And so it, coming up with something that we're, we're creating not only a, a task list, but we're creating a um, a snapshot in time where it's a reporting tool. We we really like the dashboard. On the bottom here, you can see you've got safety programs in here. And so in this case, it was back in 20, this was a 2016 dashboard when all the Hascom and SDS changes were in place. And so we had we added to it and we customized the dashboard and we we put hascom employee training um hascom con, con container labeling you know the shift to sdss and in different facilities uh you know as this dashboard evolved and we we typically do these monthly uh for clients uh you know there was a time when hascom employee training would have been red yellow and green depending on the facility some facilities are early adopters or were the first to be scheduled mm. And um, and others, uh, for, you know, for that facility might have noted when that training was scheduled for. You can see we have a, also an ergonomics program. This particular client had a lot of rep- repetitive motion um, issues uh, just as part of their process, and so we looked at what can we do for that. So this is everything. I mean, it's this everything. Is everything. You know, Health, a- absolutely. It's and it it not only gives you as the environmental manager a good pulse of your own system, but it's a really a nice tool to involve others. And, and share that information. You know, okay. we've got some other tools uh, as well. We like to in- incorporate technology where we can. Uh, this is an example just of a weekly inspection checklist. Uh, WNM uses some software. You know, if you can type it in Word or type it in Excel, we can we can shift it into a, a digital checklist uh, in with with very little effort. And these are used on iPhones and iPads and tablets and and or a laptop through a through a website. And, and it really makes it nice. So you can see that for this one, it took the person 44 seconds to do this inspection, which isn't out of the ordinary if they're doing it all the time. You know, they would have gr- pulled their name from the uh, drop down list right here. It says assigned and no assignment. But, you know, Lance, if you were doing this, you'd, you'd grab your name, Lance, off of the this and note that you did it, the date of your inspection, and then you start answering the questions. And, and, and then when you hit save, it's going to automatically uh, shift it into a database and, and be your your proof that the inspection was was completed. If you say if you if you answer any of these questions like here is the chlorine gas cylinder chained it says no. Well then it pops up under there and says you know we need a comment for that. Why was it not chained? Oh the chain is missing. Well well what are we going to do about that? So how do we get that repaired so that on the next checklist it's it's and so remedied? Does this go in so you said it goes into a database but does that go into some kind of an exception report to his my manager that you know cuz hey I just reported that it's changed. now is it my responsibility to go buy the chain or or so anyway what I'm, my point is is that you don't want to be just um, doing the checklists checklist for the checklist say yeah yeah exactly so, you don't you don't just want to pencil whip it and, and certainly if you're gonna gonna go through the effort to have a checklist you need to take the corrective action so that the issues get resolved and so that's that's part of the process and and that we help people yeah because you uh, know what but so we, you know if there is an issue what's the process what's our expectation of of time do we always or, or is our goal to uh, correct issues within a week is our goal to correct issues within a day uh, or a month, you know, depending on the facility in your organization, you, you might have a different expectation. Um, but the the nice thing is, is 
not only for management, but for peace of mind, for risk tolerance, and 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 even that inspector. You know, you've you've now got this uh, this tool where you can say, oh yeah, we inspect it weekly, and here's here's the list. You want to see it? Mm-hmm. And, and that that goes a long way with inspectors. Um, there's a couple other tools. We're not we're not saying these are one size fits all, but these are some examples of tools. This is uh, next couple shots are from a software called Wastelink, uh, a Texas company, and and this is uh, you know predominantly for large quantity generators or facilities that generate a, a high volume of waste or might have a number of different uh, waste streams and waste profiles. But it's always a challenge to 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 manage that and. And if you're in Texas and you're managing it through steers, then that's that's certainly not the the most ideal way to do it. But but this is a dashboard here in terms of waste, and it can it can show you some notifications and some some areas that need action. Uh, it can show you upcoming schedule for inspections or for if a if a a profile might be expiring soon. But it can also uh, be used as an inventory management or shipment uh, reminders or even for reporting. And and so I, I guess the point in, in showing these is, and you can go to the next one too. Um, yeah. Is is think about what the right tools for your facility are, and um, yes, there might be an initial cost, but what kind of structure does it does it overlay into your organization so that that not only you as the environmental manager, but but the the leadership team uh, can have some confidence that that things are being handled appropriately. But even if they can't, let's say that. Um, the cost for the software is like, yeah, that's not in, in our budget. You can show them ways. Yeah. Use Excel. Right? Yeah. You can show yeah. them ways how to we, do that. We don't always have to Im- implement some, you know, and our goal is never to ex- in- implement an expensive solution, but what if we hung a marker board in the wastewater room? You know, what if we, what if we use a, you know, a shared Excel spreadsheet amongst uh, this, this core group, this mm-hmm. core group uh, and this team. And, and so we've had great successes with marker boards and, and and other things as as in order to track progress and to share information so that so that we know um, what's coming up. So again, sounds really basic, but but when you implement them, it's really interesting how behaviors change. When yeah. people know you're measuring something or you're looking or at looking. it, it yeah. guess what? Absolutely. That's uh, we, that's why we all slow down when we see the cop ahead. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Okay. Um, so somebody asked a question. In the future, do you see an increased role in geographic information systems (GIS) and building information modeling (BIM) within a successful environmental compliance program to centralize information for all stakeholders within a company? Yeah, that's a that's a great observation and question. We have a couple clients that are well on their way to that. You know, we we GPS every uh, air emission point uh, into into the company's GIS model, and um, the beauty of that is as as the facility expands, we've got a really tight model of what's there now, and and now we're just uh, focusing our efforts on that that little bit of expansion. Or you might look at waste generator status. We've uh, even even companies that are that are across the U.S. As you look for ways to minimize your waste spend, we can we can go in and show uh, with it, with some GIS mapping or or tools the amount of waste we're generating and where, and that can really help a vendor, uh, you know, create a milk run or a client specific process or, or or service to to minimize cost. You know, what if we what if we used our, our 90 day holding areas to, in, in you know, in, instead of just picking up everything at 30 days. And, and what if we came up with a good plan that not only fit into the regs, but, uh, but saved us some money. So yeah, we've seen a couple of really good uses of that uh, with GIS becoming more accessible and, and mainstream. I, I only see that, that mapping and those information systems becoming that much more. And even real time reporting too. Real time reporting. Uh, you know, and I just thought of another area where we've seen it and that's the, on the, on the building management and building information systems that, that that person referenced. When you look at uh, hazard areas within a facility, or you might have an area um, that the, where you need um, respirator training, or you need certain certain training to to enter that area, as you're doing employee onboarding and training and annual refresher training, you can really use some of these nice tools to to visually show 
the differences across a facility and help on your safety side? Okay. Good question. Yeah, great question. So uh, here's the seven keys to success again. Yeah, so just one more time through them, the seven keys. The, we talked about the communication, uh, the team, and involving others. Of course, know your regs, and and, and most importantly, know, know why – why that regulation applies and for how long, you know, it's really, if you're growing company, if we, if we draw more water from the aquifer, at what point are we maxed out? Or if we're, if we're, if we're really close to becoming a large quantity uh, hazardous waste generator, uh, that's going to be an important threshold to know because things change at that point. So, so know under what circumstances your, those regulations apply. Uh, Establish best practices within the organization. Of course, train your people and, and do some awareness training so that everybody can help. Uh, establish some goals, track them, uh, in, include them on a dashboard or a marker board or, a, or some central location so people can see, the team can see your progress towards those goals and those metrics. And then use some tools. You know, don't, don't, um, don't feel like you need to use the you know, pen and paper for everything. And, and, and maybe there's some ways you can simplify your role. And, but also show um, show better that these these inspections are being completed. And you know, hey, sometimes using software can be a, a huge time saver anyway. So you know, and, and you can pay for it exactly. And, and even with Excel, right? Yeah. We can do a lot of this in, in Excel and, and not not have uh, a, a software cost. But but the point is, establish think about what's good for your team and good for your system, and and see what you can do with okay. it. So Nick, so on on. We're going to wrap this up really quick, but so basically there's, if, you know, they, if somebody are listening out there, they want to get started, the, really the first thing that they probably want to do is get a hold of somebody and say, hey, let's do the RAS or regulatory accountability screen because that's kind of your, that's just in layman's term, that's your wellness checkup. That's your going to the doctor, making sure that everything is mm -hmm. good, right? Yeah. And in, in most cases, I mean, we see that as the starting point where there's a single point of contact for environmental health and safety. And of course, that person is going to be extremely overwhelmed and, and almost always is never trained in environmental health and safety. I mean, right. none, of, none of us are, let's be honest, mm -hmm. learning on the job. And so that can be helpful. There's also a lot of companies we walk into where they have a great understanding of that. Their process, their facility has been, been you know established for a long time. They've got some some good systems in place, and but they're not getting the results they want. And so then we look at maybe some awareness training, or can we implement a dashboard? Uh, because let's face it, if you're a concrete batch plant and you've got a hundred locations, you know the rules that apply to you. You're mm -hmm. probably active in that industrial organization. But if you're not getting the results you want, then what can we overlay there? That's where these seven keys come in. You know, we're we're not talking the technical details, but some other 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 um, components we can overlay onto that to to have a successful program. So yeah, that's uh, my contact information is here. Of course, we've got a really strong team of of environmental compliance and EHS experts at WM. So you know, odds are I is the my role now as the as the president. I'm probably won't be on your site, but uh, yeah, reach out to me. We'll get the right people engaged. But the odds are somebody from A&M will call them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we do have a fair amount yeah, of folks from A&M, right? So, and there, so here's his contact information and connect with them on LinkedIn. Nick, thanks for joining us today. Great, inform, great webinar, great information. Hopefully it was helpful to our listeners. Um, I just also want to um, announce our next webinar um, in June. I can't believe we're in June already. But it's going to be stormwater compliance in practice. It's always, always a very popular webinar. Uh, Jennifer Adams and Vanessa <sighs> Coleman are uh, going to be hosting. Well, with just me just one month. quick note on our on our team. Most uh, many of our of our team did come from industry. Jennifer and Vanessa are both two good examples of that. They've yeah. been environmental managers. They've been regional and environmental directors, and so. Um, It'd be interesting to have that perspective. Looking forward to June's webinar. Yeah, it's going to be great. So, all right, guys, thanks for joining us today. We'll see you next time. Have a great weekend, Memorial Day weekend. Have a great one. That's right. Enjoy. Bye -bye.